Ephesians 1, verses 1 through 6, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your holy word as we look into the book of Ephesus or of Ephesians today. We uh, just open our hearts and our minds to Pastor Jim as he brings your word to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Mickey. Mickey told me the, this morning that he really enjoys uh, sharing and, and he doesn't mind speaking in front of people and he just commented that he's got a, a face and a voice made for radio. So uh, we appreciate you stepping out and, and doing that for us. It was my full intention today uh, to get through these six verses because uh, that was my uh my break when you see how it reads in your in your passage it, it it goes through and that's where there's a natural break i'm going to let you know right now that i can only get through three verses today so because we read all six i didn't want you to start to panic around noon when i'm only <laughs> wrapping up you know verse two uh but uh, that uh, we're going to not have to run through this we get to spend time it's my intent that uh, we would take the opportunity to not just run past something, even something that's just an introduction, because, oh, it's just an introduction. It's all scripture that we're uh, considering, and, and it's all scripture that will change our hearts uh, into uh, that which God has intended for us. So last week, we introduced the relationship of Paul, the apostle, and uh, his special relationship with uh, the church of Ephesus. We talked about how he made it a, almost a mad dash through that part of the country, the world, on his way back to uh, Antioch and uh, to visit the brothers there. And then he just immediately turned around and launched into his third missionary journey. He promised them, if the Lord wills, I'll be back. And that he was. Ended up spending about three years in Ephesus, teaching, growing the church, impacting the whole region because of what he was doing. Because if you look, I mentioned in Revelation, when it, it starts talking about the, the churches that are the letters that are written there, those seven churches are all in this region of Asia. Apostle Paul had a great ministry while he was there. Now, when we study Ephesians, different authors, commentators, um, teachers have broken this down in different outlines. John MacArthur likes to point out that the first half of Ephesians is doctrinal. And the second half is practical. Watchman Nee wrote a commentary on this and he named it Sit, Walk, Stand. And in doing so, he was talking about the fact that we sit at the feet of Christ and we learn from him as a new believer because of the doctrines that are placed there are just fundamental to our, our Christian start. And then he says walk. Because as we mature. We go from, from sitting. And able to aim, amble about. And so our Christian walk. But then there's the Christian 
um, the mature Christian who stands in spiritual battle. And that's the stand. Stand firm, especially when you're faced with the, the satanic or spiritual forces and that we deal with as mature Christians. Harold Horner talks about the calling of the church and the conduct of the church. So when we go through for these next months, year, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't measured it out. I mean, if I can get three verses squeezed in today, what does that say for the prospects along the way? But as we go through, just pay attention to that. The fact is that the first half of the letter, Paul is really talking doctrine. He wants to remind them of the firm foundation that he gave them. And then how it plays out, the practical. The theme today is reconciliation. Every time I'm, I'm opening my Bible, I'm seeing how God is reaching out to man. How God is calling for repentance and a restoration of a relationship. This is the work of Christ to bring about our salvation. And there's aspects to this salvation. We have three of them. And if you're taking notes, these are the kind of things that you can write down and follow later. Our justification. Justification, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. A great verse, key verse. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That which happens... At conversion, the judge sitting there looking at a guilty person, you and me, but yet the advocate, the defendant, Jesus Christ, says, when you look at this person who has committed himself and, and prayed to receive my blood as a covering, you are now declared not guilty. Justification. Some have said, just if I had never sinned. And that's the blood of Christ. That's the first aspect of our salvation, which we acquire upon our confession of faith. The second one is sanctification. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Second Thessalonians 2.13. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, by, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. Sanctification is that which happens in our Christian walk from the day we believe to the day we meet him in eternity. Sanctification is the process of becoming like Christ. And that's important because that shows that God is at work in you. That God is changing you. He's making, he's outfitting you for heaven. He's, you know, we're, we're, we're imperfect beings here. I have to admit, I'm an imperfect being. My wife will admit that too. I'm an imperfect being. But by the grace of God, through the process of sanctification... I am getting stronger and better year by year, day by day, moment by moment. And that's my encouragement to you, that we, we continue to walk with the Lord, allow Him to change us. That's our sanctification. The third part of our, our uh, salvation is glorification. Glorification is that which we stand before God, clothed, fully clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, Perfect and complete. So what we want to do is we want to learn all we can about Jesus Christ. His pre-incarnate existence, his incarnation, and his life, death, and resurrection. And also his ascension. And this has all taken place. What we're looking for now is the rapture for his church. And the promised return to establish his kingdom here on earth. That's still to come. Maybe not so far away. 
So, in studying all this, before I get into it, I wanted to make the comment, because of salvation given by Christ, is that I've come to the conclusion that we are saved by works. Just not our works. The work of Christ. His atonement, his sacrifice, the blood, satisfaction, and forgiveness of our sin. So we can conclude there's nothing we can do to supplement the salvation that Jesus provides. It's not faith and then our works. It's, it's not faith that brings us to God and then works that maintain it. We're saved by faith made righteous by the blood of Christ. There is a a relationship of works, and we'll study that in Ephesians 2.10, because when you look at the key verses, almost I think every Awana group would study Ephesians 2.8 and 9, where it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, that no one should boast. But we stop short because I love verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. And when you come to Christ, then you can start to fulfill that relationship. Those works that he's he's actually provided for us so that we can get engaged So let's start. That was my intro. Look at verse 1. Ephesians 1.1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus, and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Paul tells the church. Because realize this that there's others who have come through these churches. When we, when we study 1 Timothy, which hopefully will dovetail in, when we study that, Paul is warning Timothy about being careful about people that are coming in slandering or, or bringing false doctrine. Because if, if the original message is out there, then Satan sure, certainly is going to have a counterfeit message in order to try and trick people, to draw them away, to confuse them, to confound them. But this is the original. Paul is showing his apostleship. He's putting it out there. I am an apostle of Christ Jesus. Not because he wanted to, but because of the will of God. That's his divine appointment. And who are these Ephesians? Those who are faithful in Christ Jesus. I have to point out, faithful is not the idea that they're faithfully walking and faithfully hitting all the markers. But they're faithful in believing the gospel message, that which was preached to them. That's where the faithfulness comes in. And then the result of that is that the lives have been changed. So we aren't perfect living every day, are we? Anybody make it all this whole week perfect living, faithful? But have you believed the message this week every day on how faithful God is to us and that we have faithfully believed in God? It's our Our faith that makes us faithful, not our actions. I think I'm going to move her to verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, there's something that you don't see in this verse. You don't see greetings, salutations, howdy. Greetings was the typical word that people would write. Greetings in the name of Caesar Augustus or greetings. 
That would be a proper welcoming, but not the way God has it. What you do see is grace and, to you and peace. Grace to you and peace. This is a new way of, of greeting people. It elevates the message that much higher. So let's look at this word grace. It's used 13 times in Ephesians alone. Verse 2, grace and peace from God. Verse 6, the glory of His grace. Verse 7, the riches of His grace. And chapter 2, verse 8, saved by grace. So grace is God's actions toward us. Not on the merit of what we deserve, but what we need. Out of His goodness and generosity, grace. The word translates charis to charity. So, charity. Charity to you. God's charity. The first thing that this causes me to do is stop. Evaluate myself. I hope it gives you an opportunity also to evaluate because I pray that we have the ability to recognize and exhibit this godly characteristic in our life, in our lives to others around us. Because this is the example of Christ when he came to meet with sinners. Did he show much grace to the Pharisees? He shared with them. And finally, when they rejected him, he used parables just to actually in a manner, matter of grace so that they didn't have more condemnation for more rejection of him. But the grace that Christ exhibited when they lowered the man through the roof, he healed him. He made the blind to see. He cast demons out of those afflicted. And he forgave sin. Just like the woman at the well. Christ exhibited grace. May we also exhibit this kind of grace. Especially to those you see on the street that maybe offend you by the way they act or by the way they dress. They're lost. They're part of the world. Do we expect them to act otherly? They're just going by what they know, not by what they don't know. It's our opportunity to extend grace. We don't judge. That's not our job. So concerning those out in the world... Look how you can extend grace to them. And also to our fellow believers. We're not perfect. Life doesn't always play out perfectly. So we have a choice. Do we bury our wounded or do we bring healing to them? And I vote that we bring healing. That we extend only because we know how much grace that God has given each one of us. So if there's someone in your heart, in your mind, that God is speaking to you in any of this illustration, commit them to prayer and ask God to give his grace through you to them. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. It's just the book forward to this if you'd like to turn there and look at it. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. 
Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens. That which is too big for one person to carry is that term. There's actually another illustration. It says in in verse 5, to bear your own burden. And in that case, Paul's talking about the, the, the ability for you to carry that you're responsible for, that your backpack can carry. You want to think about it. But in this case, in verse 2, when it says bear one another's burden, it's a boulder. Not one person is designed to be able to carry that burden. It takes others to come alongside and help that person. Grace is provided by God for in our salvation. And there's a conflict because God's holiness requires a payment for sin, doesn't it? And death is that only accept, acceptable sacrifice. Scripture tells us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. Hebrews 10.4 says it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So grace that's mentioned here in verse 2 of Ephesians 1. Grace is God providing that sacrifice in Christ. Turn a few books over to Titus. Thessalonians, Timothy, Titus. Titus chapter 2, starting with verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men. Bringing salvation to all men? Well, don't go thinking that you found that proof verse that everyone's going to be saved. Let's read on. Instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. So what we have is Christ providing the way. But what it has is also us stepping and accepting that Christ has provided that way. That's the solution to the conflict. God's love and his justice are divinely brought together and satisfied through the perfect lamb of Jesus Christ. If nothing else, you understand that. You have a message to everyone you meet. Titus 3, next chapter over. Verses 5 through 7. I remember this passage because this was a passage I was teaching on probably back in 1979. And one of my buddies, sitting in Bible study, had been around for a while. After I read this passage and talked about it, he said, I need that. I've been here listening But I need this. This is what I don't have in my life. But when the kindness of God, verse 5, chapter 3 of Titus. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace... We would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And that was the verse that turned to my friend and gave him that illumination of of the witness to understand what God was offering. Saved us, not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in, in righteousness, but according to his mercy. So, have you ever had somebody argue with you or detract from what you're sharing and he said well how can God send people to hell isn't he supposed to be loving 
And I cannot, I will not believe in a God who sends people to hell. Hmm? Anybody hear that? Theologian Millard Erickson writes, Sometimes the justice of God is impugned on the grounds that some receive this grace of God and others do not. That means some people will shun it angrily that some people receive the grace of God and others do not. But that any are saved at all is, however, the amazing part of this. For if God gave to all what they deserved, all, us being all, none would be saved. None. So the final reply to this is that God never sends anybody to hell. We have already sent ourselves there. But by the grace of God, he has provided a way, salvation through Christ. And that's the wonderful truth. May we meditate on this, thank him for it, and talk about this often. Grace. I may not get through three verses. Peace with God, verse 2. Peace from God, actually. Peace from God. And that's the relational result we have by experiencing God's grace. When God has extended grace, and you've received it through that salvation. What a change happens in your life. And now you have a relationship with God, and it gives us peace with God. This is the tranquil state of a soul, assured of its salvation through Christ. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the same kind of peace that was presented at the, the birth of Christ. Luke chapter 2, verse 14. There, uh, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. God's announcing peace. So we have peace with God because of our relationship. And we also have the peace of God. Because once we understand where we stand with God, and, and I want to just step away a second from what I had prepared and say that this world doesn't know peace. This world is in turmoil, whether it's on an individual basis and you read of how the, the newspapers are, are really uh, showing each and every time uh, someone's uh, lashing out in anger and rebellion. And we read of shootings or knifings or truck bombings. There's no peace. But we don't fear that, do we? Because we have peace with God and peace of God. Even in persecuted nations. I was talking with Frances yesterday about the Sudanese. And she shared about how strong their faith is and how positive they are. A nation that has literally nothing. And Christians who have less than that. They're persecuted and killed. And they have peace of God. Because... What's the worst that can happen to us? Somebody kills us? That's pretty bad. But what does that place us? It places us directly in relationship with God in heaven. So I don't fear what could happen because I have the peace of God. I'm content with what I have now. Whatever it is, I'm content. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, very Familiar verse, passage if you want to turn to it, just after Ephesians. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, 
will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is an experiential peace because of our relationship, our justification by faith. John Walvoord calls this a flood of peace. A flood of peace because nothing can contain it. There's no riverbank steep enough, no floodplain big enough to contain this. It will surpass any boundaries. But wait, there's more. Or wait, but wait, there's more. Philippians 4, 8, and 9. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Why fear anything in this world, folks? The God of peace will be with you. Mark it down. Revisit it as often as you need to. Because to know God is to experience peace. And by experiencing his peace, you you experience the presence of God himself. Because the God of peace will be with you. That's that uh, plaque that you've seen, the picture of footprints in the sand. And And the story is that there's two sets of footprints, but then it goes to one set of footprints, and the person says, God, you told me you would walk with me. But during the, the most darkest part of my life, there's only one set of footprints. What happened? And God says, yes, that was the time I was carrying you. Let's remember that. Today, actually my second summary point is how close are you to God? Are you experiencing trials pain right now? Can you see past today? Or are you overwhelmed with fear? Because this is the place where God can provide a peace that the world will never know. If this is something you're struggling with, please let us know. Please let me know so I can pray with you and encourage you. Come alongside And assist in your time of need. That's what we do here at church. We pray with people. We get involved. In a good way. Galatians 6.2 once again. We're to bear one another's burdens. And thereby fulfill the law of Christ. I just wanted to let you know. We have a prayer room right off the sanctuary. It's my intent to be there. 15 minutes before the service starts every Sunday. In that prayer room, I'll be praying for us that God would be glorified. If you want to join me, please do so. It's a quick five minutes or so. I think it's our privilege to do so. But after the service, when you're dealing with things, God's working in your life and you want to share with somebody or ask questions, I'll also be back there after saying hi and bye to everybody. I'll just step back there. Also, I, I, I'd recommend that um, uh, some of the, the other men and ladies of the church who are gifted with counseling would be back there, one or two. Because you know what? We could even close the, the service with prayer back there. But if there's somebody here that is just dealing with something that's too heavy, too hard. They want to make a commitment, a decision in their life. Well, let's do that. And, and, and take it before the Lord in prayer. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly heavenly places in Christ. The 
first half of this verse, verse 3, blessed be God. And it's not just blessed be God, it's blessed be God. It's very emphatic. Just like Psalm 1. It's a very emphatic blessing. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the way. That's an emphatic exclamation punctuation. Same thing here. This is blessed. Blessed be God. Now, how is God blessed? God is blessed by us when we respond to him in faith and we offer praise to him. God is blessed. The word is the same word that we use for eulogy. To speak well of somebody. God who is our Father, we mentioned that in verse 2, and also the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 3, has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. So not only is God blessed, blessed be God, but God is giving us every spiritual blessing. And again, it's emphatic. It's a, it's a, it's a, a pound on the podium kind of thing which I won't do, because we know what noise that makes. Boom. There, I did it. Blessed us with every spiritual blessing. This is a very frequent phase, phrase. It is a frequent phrase. Mentioned over 400 times in the Old Testament alone. Believers, every age, has been blessed by God with his favor. And this is a spiritual blessing, not just physical. It's not, it's not that people are, are, are counting the coins or, or the, 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 the gifts in, in that come and show in the way of, of toys or whatever. This is a spiritual blessing. This is, stands apart from anything. The spiritual blessings of the Trinity... When I think about it, the work of the Godhead is that we're going to break it down in chapter 1. You may make a note and we'll revisit this. The selection of us by the Father, verses 4 through 6. The selection of us by the Father, verses 4 through 6. The sacrifice of the Son, verses 7 through 12. Sacrifice of the Son. And then the sealing of the Holy Spirit. You ever wonder about the Trinity, the Godhead? It's right here in the first chapter. Read the whole chapter. Don't just read a part. Verses 13 and 14, the sealing of the Holy Spirit. Blessings, as I noted, provided in love. Verse 1, verse 4. He's freely bestowed on us, verse 6. The riches of his grace, verse 7. Lavished on us, verse 8. According to his kind intention, verse 9. It's not a mistake that he says that we are so blessed by God, emphatically. He blessed us, and he continues to bless us. So... My third point, how well do we count our blessings? Sometimes we forget, don't we? So do you thank God for providing for you, first of all, your salvation and your security? Is this something you take to him daily? You thank, you, you thank him for your, the providence that you receive and protection? When you lay your head on the pillow at night, how grateful are you? Does that peace of God wash over you at that point? Next week, we will talk about election, adoption, and predestination. I read through a magazine this week 
It was a commemorative edition of Decision Magazine reflecting on the life and ministry of Billy Graham. I would like to end the sermon, this part, with the words of Billy Graham because he would ask everyone within the sound of his voice, are you ready to meet God? Are you ready to meet God? And this is probably the most honest question. With all that God has done for you to provide salvation, forgiveness of sin, to provide you a new life, a new relationship, a new eternity, are you ready to meet God? And there's two valid responses. If you never had, you respond and you ask God for forgiveness and salvation. You repent, you turn around, turn to God, and you accept that payment that was provided by the death of Christ. But that may not be the issue. The issue may be that you've been walking away from God. You've been straying out, doing your own thing, serving yourself, not serving God. Come on back. Make it right between you and God. Billy Graham would say, don't put off which today can be secured. Don't put off from that which today can be secured. You have no promise of tomorrow. Let's pray. Father God, it's at this point we thank you, first of all, for your blessings. We bless you, but we receive the blessings that you've given to us for salvation, for a new relationship. And I pray, Father, because in a group like this, there may be some struggling. They need your salvation. So I pray for that, Lord. You work in their heart and allow them to, at this time, pray and receive Christ. Make that commitment secure today. But Father, also, for those who may have been part of the walking wounded and straying away from you, I just pray, Father, you call them back because you are a kind and gracious and forgiving Heavenly Father. As you waited for the prodigal son, you also wait for us to turn back to you. That you may receive us and once again bring us into a close relationship. So I pray for those. Thank you for restoring us, Lord, in whichever way that we can receive it. I pray for the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension to be something that we hold on to this week. No matter of the circumstances of this world because it's all in your hands. And I thank you, Jesus Christ. Every day of my life, I want to thank you for this. It's in your wonderful name I pray. Amen. Would you all please rise for the final song?